Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies, and our guest is Joe Jaffe, who is co-editor of the German uh, newspaper Die Zeit. Uh, Joe, welcome back. Uh, democracies, Germany and the United States, both democracies have to make foreign policy in this new world we're in. Compare uh, them in the way they respond to today's world. I mean, first of all, <clears throat> I think they're more similar than dissimilar when it comes to the issue of democracy, not with, notwithstanding their disparity in, in size and power. But um, politics has become really quite local. Not all politics, but a lot of politics have become local. And there has been a, there has been a tremendous decline in the interest for foreign policy since the fall of the wall and the end of the Soviet Empire for a very simple reason is that we no longer confront existential issues like nuclear war, <clears throat> like a third world war, uh, or any of those local regional crises like the Middle East which immediately threatened to become global, global contests. So the existential nature of foreign policy being gone, the democracies everywhere um, are losing interest in, in it. And you can, one of the signs you can see is, you look at newspapers, so elite newspapers, I'm not talking about small town newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, <coughs> how, um, how much more space non-international stories, especially business stories, the story has become business, uh, take, take in the newspapers, and that's true of all democracies. Now there's a big difference, of course. Germany, like um, Italy, like France, like S Sweden, is a middle power and one that uh, no longer thinks in global terms. But the Swedes, the Dutch, the Germans used to think in global term terms, but they don't. And so, <clears throat> the, on the United States is a global power, the only global power. And so the most important difference is that the United States matters a hell of a lot more in the global system than Germany or all the others. And, and Germany's problem in part is uh, belonging, uh, being part of the world so that it won't go alone as it has in the past. State that better for me, this, this coming well, to terms with both its, uh, well, its geographic <clears throat> position and its history. Yeah. Well, if you, if you look at the, at the world and at yourself from a, from a Berlin vantage point, you look at this century, then two, uh, two lessons are kind of almost genetically imprinted on you. It's whenever Germany tried to go it alone, it reaped ever larger disaster. This is World War I, World War II. And when Germany, as after World War II, <coughs> pursued its interests in, in community, in multilaterally, in international organizations such as NATO and the EU, it flourished beyond belief. And I think together <coughs> those two historical lessons can explain about 90% of German contemporary German foreign policy. And what about uh, what about the United States? I mean, what what is what is beside its uh, its its hegemonic position, besides the the universality apparently of what it has to offer the world? What what is what is uh, uh, particularly marked about the way it's going to approach the world? The United States. Yes. <clears throat> well, let's start off with its position in the international system, which is unique, uniquely powerful. This, sh this uh, sobriquet, here, the last remaining superpower, is really true. There's nothing out there remotely resembling the U.S. And more importantly, there's not, there's not going to be anything out there for the next 25 years remotely resembling the United States. So the United States is this, this singular animal in the international jungle or forest that is interested in everything that is happening and that uh, triggers the interests of everybody mm -hmm. when it does something. So this double role as being number one, uh, overwhelmingly powerful, but also overwhelmingly um, watched, 
because it affects so many people around the world, the whole world. That's what makes that. That's what distinguishes the U.S. from any other country. Um, you don't hear uh, people protest um, Malaysian power or these days, or even Russian power these days. But the United States is ubiquitous, overwhelming, and uh, in many respects also indispensable. Now, if the U.S. is is that important in today's world. Do you fault uh, our leaders, uh, say the Clinton administration, for not coming up with a strategic design well, for how it should act in the world? <laughs> but <clears throat> American leaders have rarely done that. In fact, um, Western leaders have rarely done that. And those who pretended to do that, let's say like Charles de Gaulle in the 50s and 60s, were really not following a strategic design. They were, they were more like, they were like strutting on stage. Uh, than, than, than implementing a strategic design. Okay, so this is not part of the American tradition. It's even less of the American, in the American tradition now because of what we said earlier, foreign policy doesn't matter that much anymore. And uh, Clinton, least of all, would be somebody uh, to articulate a strategic design. But <coughs> if you look beyond the rhetoric or non-rhetoric, and this will be true for his successor and their successors, is that the United States has to follow a certain script, whether it articulates it or not, and that strip, script comes from being number one. And that script, um, the most important rule in that script is you want to stay number one as long as you can, and therefore you want to keep others from forming hostile coalitions against you. And uh, that is something, that script, unwritten though it is, is something that Clinton has followed, and that will be followed by any American leader. The only issue is, can they, can they get enough support for this game at home? Now, you, you believe that, that America's presence in some form is very important uh, across the board in, in mm -hmm. all of the regions. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what role do you think it should be playing? What, what should be its model well, for its, its strategic involvement in these? But look, it's, it's already playing that role, which is the only one it, it, it can really play. Let's take, take Asia, <clears throat> where the waters are, re are you know, repeatedly being roiled by carefully ritualized clashes between uh, the United States and India, uh, <laughs> India, China. Um, now, what is, what is America's role there? And why does everybody want to keep the United States there? They protect Japan, the United States protects Japan, and therefore keeps Japan from becoming a muscular imperial power, which will trigger all kinds of nasty countervailing responses in Asia. It protects everybody against the overweening ambitions of China. It is a kind of, if you wish, a kind of buffer state, the, uh, the mother of all buff buffer states, if you wish, that is protecting everybody against everybody else in an arena which is rife with ambition and rivalries and rising powers, not only China, but, um, but India, and then <coughs> behind them, Indonesia. So the United States is, is f this, this charges this enormously important function of being a kind of security, a background security factor uh, in, in the region, which stabilized the region enormously. And uh, I think Clinton or whoever, will, wh whoever understand that, that the United States is this buffer factor that will keep stability in that volatile region. Now, as a, as a student of Waltz, uh, you you clearly believe in 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 in, in the constraints <laughs> that are placed on a state uh, by its place uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, among uh, other states. Or the states. opportunities. Yeah, the op or the opportunities. Now, and, and, and so you're not surprised that so many of the German leaders today who were radicals in the yeah. uh, in the uh, 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 the 60s, yeah, 70s. Uh, in the uh, all the way to the 80s, all the way to the 80s, your your yeah. foreign minister, yeah. Yeah. Uh, your chancellor yeah. uh, have have become so uh, conservative and so in a way consistent with yeah. German history. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to believe, if you want to have a wonderful illustration of the Waltzian hypothesis, which is really structures destiny or to put it in more vernacular terms, where you stand depends on where you sit, mm -hmm. your geographic location, and your, your, your weight in, in the larger scheme of power. Germany is a wonderful, uh, wonderful example, because as you correctly pointed out, there's Chancellor Schroeder since 1998, there is <coughs> Joschka Fischer, also foreign minister since 1998. These guys were rabid left-winger and anti-Americans. Um, and ha hardly have the, hardly ha hardly <coughs> were they in power, when their rhetoric was had had turned 180 degrees. I mean, Joschka Fischer, the Green, who used to kind of probably throw rocks at the American consulate in Frankfurt when he was younger, says he loves NATO, he loves the United States. Uh, he he is the very model of reasonableness, he believes in integration, in Germany's place in integration, and so is Schroeder. So they're obviously responding in terms of German national interests, which I tried to outline before, which is being in this constraining framework is good for German power. It's a legitimizing framework. It's as if Gulliver loved his ropes, mm -hmm. as if the ropes were the very condition of its self-assertion. I know it's a mixed metaphor, but that's about uh, uh, the basic thing. So the Germans have learned to use, to exert their influence multilaterally through institutions, and they're very good at it. And the nice thing about it is, because there's a self-assertion, nobody has to be afraid of the Germans, mm -hmm. which would have been the strongest, would be the strongest blow to, to their influence and to their power. Why is NATO and our uh, continuing support <coughs> of NATO are so important uh, in the European context? Well, NATO is an interesting paradox because you know, the war is over. We won the war. NATO won the war 10 years ago when the, when, when, you know, the, fall, of the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And normally, normally alliances disappear when you win the war. That's been the historical, um, that's been the, the verdict, verdict of history on any alliance I can think of. Alliances die when they win. And yet this one is still alive 10 years after the fact. Why? Well, because, uh, in a way, for the old reasons. You want to be allied to the United States because the United States is a kind of security lender of the last resort. You never know what might happen, especially with Russia coming back. Point number one. Point number two. Um, NATO is uh, the most important thing that uh, NATO, i.e. the United States, the Atlantic um, Defense Framework, is the one thing that stands between us and the renationalization of our defense policies. Germany now you're talking about? No, in Europe in general. In Europe, okay. Yeah. There's a security area or a security community made in the USA. I see. And the same thing is also true for, 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 the, for the Pacific. Um, with that large buffer state, uh, the ultimate security lender of the United States in the game. It keeps everybody from shifting towards a national independent defense policy. Mm -hmm. The autonomy of defense policy has traditionally been one of the most important sources of conflict among nations. You know, I'm afraid of you, I arm against you, then you counter arm, then I, then I feel vindicated, I arm some more. So you take that dynamic out and um, which I called keeping away the renationalization of defense policy, and stability reigns, and we can deal with other business, namely business. Mm -hmm. so, so what then do we say about the NATO intervention in, in Kosovo? Oh. Uh, it do, do, isn't the, doesn't the pendulum swing the other yeah, way? Yeah, and so therefore, yeah. if you don't have a defense policy, you have a cacophony of voices? Yeah. yeah. 
What you, well, Kosovo is a, is a story with many lessons. Uh, one lesson the Europeans have learned in spades is that they are incapable, incapable of mounting even a Mickey Mouse operation like, like, like over the Kosovo. That was a Mickey Mouse operation mm -hmm. against a third or fourth rate power like Serbia in a very small piece of territory. And they found out that they don't have the long range logistics, they don't have the long range intelligence, they don't have the standoff weapons, etc., etc., to mount even that kind of operation. That's one of the, one of the critical lessons um, Kosovo um, inflicted on us. And, um, and it also inflicted on the Europeans the enormous dependence on the United States that unless the United States does it, nobody does it. And so there's naturally this, this as you said, the pendulum has swung too far. Naturally, there is this sense, well, why can't we do this on our own? I mean, here we are, a market that's larger than the United States. We have a larger population in the United States. We have more men under arms. So uh, let's do it on our own. That would require, on, on the other hand, a hell of a lot more defense spending, I mean, serious money, to kind of restructure Europe's post-Cold War armies, which are <coughs> hands are heavy and, and designed to fight you know, the large war of maneuver in the vast steppes of Eastern mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. It would take serious money. Uh, in the meantime, take somebody like Germany. They're all cashing in on their peace dividends. And Germany, now, in terms of spending per... per um, per capita is just above the um, Luxembourg, mm -hmm. lowest rung of the ladder. <laughs> so you can't cash in your peace dividends and become a semi-autonomous military actor. And so that at this point sh again shows how the United States, though the large, great, the bear, the strategic threat is gone, you still need the United States as somebody who in the parlance of, you know, of the of, you know, more academic parlance, provides public goods, mm -hmm. which the Europeans at this point are not yet capable of doing. Now, uh, humanitarian intervention, which is what Kosovo was mm -hmm. about, uh, d does that get countries, uh, well, especially the United States, away from uh, their vital interests? Of course. <clears throat> um, it's 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 it's. Uh, so cliche written, I almost don't want to repeat it, but a lot of our, you might almost, almost say that modern liberal Western states will only intervene when the, when the interest is not involved. It's very hard to get involved <laughs> for you know, classical goals of statecraft. Because there's no reason to? Is well, the idea of, of, of uh, reason of state, of, of national interest, that's all being deconstructed as we as mm. we sit here and talk, and has been. Um, so the very idea, appeal to a national interest sounds, or reason, let alone reason of state, mm -hmm. raison d'état, sounds arcane, almost bizarre. Mm -hmm. So it seems that um, we will only do uh, this kind of stuff, humanitarian intervention. And a lot of that stuff is, of course, driven by the very opposite of, you know, Coldly calculated realpolitik, interest politics. It's, it's television driven. It's CNN driven. It's it's the the outrage du jour, and there's something mendacious about it because precisely because there's no interest behind it, we are not willing to put anything in it. So when we go to Kosovo, we say, well, we'll do it, but nobody can get killed on our side. Mm -hmm. No body bags. So therefore, we don't do ground troops. Therefore, what is left, we, then we end up bombing Milosevic's civilian infrastructure. So suddenly here, in the name of the humanitarian interest, we are conducting a war against the civilian population by bombing bridges and, and, um, and power plants and what have you. That's a pretty perverse way of being humanitarian, but it's explained by the fact that we don't perceive an interest there, and therefore we are not willing to make any sacrifice whatsoever. And that's true for the United States, and it's true for Germany, for France, for Italy, you name it.
Now, is it easier for Germany because so much of the burden falls on the United States, or is, is, is Germany taking more of its fair share of the burden? Well, when it comes to, to, to Kosovo, for instance, mm -hmm. well, I mean, as, as one wag put it, who, who a, a former high official in the Pentagon, recently told me that for every French plane that took off in the Kosovo skies, <laughs> it had to be accompanied by four American planes. One to go in front to do the defense suppression, you know, electronic mm -hmm. warfare. One in each wing for protection and one on its tail for damage assessment, which the French apparently have no capabilities for. So um, here's the sense in which the United States, by dint of its, its incredible uh, conventional technological superiority, is at this point at least, almost forced to carry most of the brunt, as it has in Bosnia and Kosovo and, of course, in, in, um, in, in, the, in the Gulf War. Um, it's easy for the Europeans to, to hang back because they know Big Daddy is there, and Big Daddy is incredibly rich and has uh, technological goodies which we uh, have no money to, to acquire. So that too kind of explains why the United States, though it creates so many, triggers so many resentments because of its power, mm -hmm. remains a welcome player in these games. D does that suggest then that the European won't, uh, in some sort of peak or frustration, yeah. go it on their own, that is provide so they can do it, yeah. uh, not under the tutelage of uh, the United it's very States? It's very hard for me to imagine what what interests might be so powerful as to kind of reverse the declining trend in European defense spending, for instance? What interests would be so overwhelming that would kind of reverse the, 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 the kind of postmodern psychology in the Western world, which says, you know, we don't want to sacrifice, we don't want to fight, uh, we don't want to, to genuflect before the state anymore mm -hmm. as we used to in the past, we just want to be left alone. We are to see that. But thirdly, there is, it's very hard to conceive of situations where the Europeans would want to do something and the United States not, or vice versa. Uh, I recently talked to a French, uh, French uh, official and uh, she said something very surprising for French. She said, you know, in the old days, we used to work with the Palmerston saying, nations have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent interests. And I think it's the other way around now. Mm -hmm. Nations have changing interests. They have no permanent interests. The interests keep changing, mm -hmm. but they have permanent allies. Mm -hmm. Permanent allies means, you know, there's that community in the West, uh, mm -hmm. a similar uh, level of economic development and political development, same kind of postmodern, democratic, liberal it's culture. And, um, and uh, plus the, um, the kind of the new rules of the game, which says you can't go on your own. You cannot intervene by yourself. You have to get some kind of legitimacy, ideally from the UN, but if you can't get that from NATO. And so that kind of keeps driving this game where indeed we might have only permanent allies, as much as we sometimes dislike and resent each other. So does this tell me that the state-centric mm -hmm. model, yeah. which has influenced your thinking about uh, international relations, is being swept away? No. It's states, it's still states rule. States have the last word, word. Um, but states can no longer do what they used to do for hundreds and hundreds of years, which is to go off on their own, to fight a war on their own, to do without any legitimizing cover um, by, by others, by, in, by international organizations, uh, because these states have, are now democratic states. They're no longer princes and potentates. And so democratic states are much more on a much shorter leash of popular acceptance and, and, and legitimation. Mind you, you know, Frederick the Great, the absolutist king, also had to worry about his people. Mm -hmm. But the leash was longer. Louis XIV had to worry about it. Louis XIV had to worry. But the leash was then much longer. That's the point. The leash has become shorter. But states are still states. 
What about globalization? Isn't it undermining the state? Well, I wouldn't know how. How is it undermining the state? What, what would you think? Well, uh, uh, states cannot control their own capital markets because there's well, an international... Yeah, but Do, the, let me ask it. Does that mean no, the, 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 the state, diminishment listen, of state power in important look, areas? States could not control their own capital market since the gold standard. Because the gold standard really was a kind of... Um, simple but powerful uh, form of monetary union which forced every country into a certain discipline unless it wanted to see its gold leave the country and therefore contracting its own money supply and driving it uh, into macroeconomic ruin. So that's not new, mm -hmm. uh, that governments are no longer in control of their, um, um, uh, their, 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 their monetary policy. Uh, are they no longer in control of their borders? I don't see that. If I look at the European Union, um, where we have forsworn not to police our borders anymore, our internal borders anymore, um, just our, our outside borders, well, strangely enough, you know, as I cross these borders, there are these flying squads uh, on the other side who are looking for drug smugglers or terrorists or whatever, so we're controlling that. Um, are we uh, uh, not controlling immigration anymore? Well, the United States has a real problem because of its, the way it has defined its 1965 immigration law, which gives priority of power as a word to families and for their reunion. So mm -hmm. the United States willingly relinquished control over its immigration, but by act of the state. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is the how, how are these borders being swept away? Let me just put the question in, in, in issue more general terms. You would expect the state to become less powerful than it was. Now, I see the state becoming more powerful in many ways. And one way to measure it, of course, is how much does this, the government take of GDP for its own purposes, by taxation and things like that? You know, in the 19th century, the state was pretty powerless. It took about between 5 and 10% in peacetime. Now the modern Western state, not the United States, but, but the European Western state, takes about 50%. Um, the OECD average is 45%. How can anybody who takes and disperses and therefore regulates as much be said to be losing power? Mm. Very hard for me to figure out. So this is true even in Europe, where oh, yeah. the, 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 the evolution of the community proceeds apace. Uh, Europe, Europe is, is a very different animal. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the modern, you know, the, 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 the normal modern Western state. Europe is a, is a very, very strange animal, which you cannot understand in classical terms of unification. Classical, classical unification has been to borrow the famous phrase by Bismarck, who unified Germany in 1871, 25 little Germanys and the one big one, uh, by blood and iron. That has been a normal pattern. Lincoln unified this country by blood and iron. The Italians did in the 19th century. Germany did. Um, unification has normally been a very bloody affair whereby the, the core power in, in the system kind of extends itself to conquer the rest. This is very different here. Uh, or, you, or, or what you have is a formal act, like the, United St like the 13 colonies in uh, 1787, when they gave, each, gave themselves a constitution. You know. We, by formal act, it's a we the people, etc., etc. Europe fits neither pattern. And I would call it like a coral reef. Mm -hmm. It keeps growing. I mean, the, the European state keeps growing, but like a coral reef, you know. You never quite know which is the next branch it will, will sprout, and so there is this uh, truly interesting, uh, intriguing mixture of very powerful state sovereignty still, and p very powerful com community sovereignty, such as well, monetary union, mm -hmm. such as the European Court, which rules against governments, such as the um, commission, where the competition commissar, commissioner, tells the German government you can't subsidize VW in the East. It's against, 
it's a constraint of trade. You can't do it. We'll take you to court. So that's a, but that's an art in progress. And it fits none of the models we have from history or international politics. One final question. With this growth of this coral reef mm -hmm. and with the, 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 the international environment that you've defined, where will uh, U.S. European relations go, or will they just evolve pretty much as they are now? Well, but you know, look, theory and history would have told you, as you know, alliances die when they win, that somehow, you know, a few years down the road after winning the Cold War, which was in '89, and the wall came down, this thing would dissolve. It isn't dissolving. This thing, I mean NATO, mm -hmm. Europe, and America. Mm -hmm. It isn't dissolving, it's growing. I mean, we've just admitted three new members there. At least half a dozen who want in, want in. So that, that suggests an enormous functionality of something which, in terms of, since you brought him up, of Waltzian theory, realist theory, mm -hmm. should not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. It should have gone the same way that the anti-Napoleon alliance or the, the, the Entente against World War I Germany should have disappeared within a few years. So there's enormous functionality. And to come back to this, this, this other thought, where I quoted this French colleague, you know, maybe nations only have permanent allies these days, especially since the United States, and that's a very important point, I think, is very different from all other previous hegemons in the history of man. This is not the 800-pound gorilla who goes around tearing down everything and grabbing territory and trying to lord over everybody else. Uh, this is the first hegemon who does not want to grab territory, who does not want to conquer. So this hegemon is more like an elephant, like a you know, 2,000-pound elephant or 4,000-pound elephant, whatever, um, who is kind of bumbling and oblivious but not rapacious. Mm -hmm. It's not like Rome uh, that's or, or like, uh, like the Habsburg Empire that's trying to conquer the world. It, uh, it's a hegemon that doesn't conquer. And that makes a lot of difference. So if, if you're dealing with an elephant rather than, let's say, a rapacious tiger. Mm -hmm. And that's why another reason why the classical historical insights do not kick in yet. And why, in spite of the disappearance of a great threat, this alliance still holds. Joe, thank you very much for mm -hmm. coming back to finish our conversation, and, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.